What up, Ken? This is Leon, the Paperback Maniac. Tonight, we are going to be doing something that I have been wanting to do for quite a while now, and I honestly couldn't think of a better second video for Movie Mayhem, seeing as we are shin deep in the month of May, than taking a look at my collection of novelizations. That's right, movie tie-ins. I've been collecting them off and on for a while now. Uh, I wouldn't say I have the biggest collection. I know that there are some people out there for whom novelizations are it, and they have just, you know, tons and tons of them. My collection is more modest. However, I do have a few that I really like a lot that are really special to me, so I thought I'd share them with you fine folks tonight. Uh, also, stick around, because once I get done showing you my novelizations, I'm also planning on showing off a few uh, rando movie-related paperbacks and a couple of coffee table books that I like a lot. So, all right, without further ado, let's get to it. First book we're looking at is Videodrome uh, by Jack Martin, a.k.a. Dennis Etchison. Uh, Dennis Etchison, that name should be familiar to people who are into vintage horror. Uh, he also, under this name, uh, this pen name, wrote novelizations for uh, Halloween 2 and 3, I believe. Uh, this book uh, is based on a screenplay by David Cronenberg, the auteur, of course, uh, and it was published by Zebra in 1983. Videodrome is a, it's a great Cronenberg flick, probably in my top three, along with The Brood and, and The Fly, of course. Okay, next up, we've got Robocop, written by Ed Naha. Uh, that name may sound familiar to you. Uh, well, probably not, but I uh, reviewed a novel by Ed Naha, uh, one of my earlier reviews, uh, Orphans. He also wrote some novelizations. Uh, this is based on a screenplay by Ed Neumeyer and Michael Miner, and it was published by Dell in 1987. Robocop, one of the great, not only one of the greatest action films of all time, in my opinion, but one of the great satires on uh, corporate America. Just Absolutely fantastic. I can watch this movie over and over again. Okay, next up, another one of the greatest action movies of all time, uh, The Terminator. Uh, now, this one is special. Uh, this is the UK novelization of The Terminator. This is one of the few movies to have gotten two completely different novelizations, one in the US and one in the UK. The reason I picked this up is, of course, because it is written by Sean Hudson, one of my favorite schlockmeisters of all time. Uh, he wrote this one, uh, adapted from a screenplay by James Cameron and his then wife, Gail Ann Hurd, the producer. Um, and this was published by Star in 1984. This was actually a pretty fun novelization. It's got the usual Sean Hudson flourishes, extremely violent, of course. It's a good time. Okay, uh, next up. Now, at first blush, this would not seem like a novelization, right? Uh, this is Dream Demon by Anne Bilson. Of course, nowhere on there uh, do you see, you know, any other attribution. Uh, and it does have originally commissioned artwork. This actually is a novelization of a very obscure uh, British horror movie that came out in the late 80s. Uh, this was um, uh, based on a screenplay by... Christopher Wicking and Harley Cockless. Harley Cockless. I'm not making that up, folks. That's an unfortunate last name. Um, I was first alerted to this movie uh, from an old issue of Fangoria I was reading. They did one of their set visits. Uh, and the, t the headline of the article was uh, Dream Demon, the UK's answer to Freddy Krueger. And I was reading this and I was like, what? How have I never heard of this movie? I mean, I consider myself quite the uh, 80s horror film aficionado. And, you know, I read this thing and, you know, they were talking about like, you know, all the gore effects that were going on and how it was this, supposed to be this surreal sort of cerebral horror novel. I looked into it and uh, it was actually released, but it's very, very obscure. It never got a legitimate release, uh, not, not not even DVD, I think. Um and uh, this was the novelization. The, the movie was not successful, and because of that, they decided to uh, go with originally commissioned artwork, which is why you don't see really any mention. And I think that they were just trying to sell it, pass it off as just an original novel. 
Uh, but that's an amazing artwork. I haven't watched the movie or read the book. Uh, this may be one that I end up reviewing. I, I told myself that I would not uh, review novelizations just because, you know, that would be, I mean, kind of like reviewing a movie and, you know, there are enough movie reviews on YouTube. But um, if it's a book or if it's a movie that I haven't seen and I'm reading the novelization as a as of just a book, and it's one that's obscure enough that probably most people haven't seen, maybe I will go ahead and uh, review it at some point. Um, okay, another one. <laughs> this is another one that you wouldn't think is a novelization. This is Patrick, uh, written by Keith Harrington and based on a screenplay by Everett DeRoche. This was published by Avon in 1980. Uh, adapted uh, based on a film, an Australian film from 1978, and uh, that is just gorgeous artwork. I th this artwork blows the uh, original one sheet movie poster away. I mean, they should have used this. Um, and I, you know, I imagine you know, there's no nowhere on this does it, it make it look like this is a novelization. I think Avon was probably thinking, well, this is an Australian production. Maybe we can fool people into just thinking it's just like a regular horror novel. Uh, I mean, not even on the back does it say anything about it being a novelization. Totally just like trying to kind of pull the, you know, trying to trying to fool the, the reader, I feel like. That's another one I haven't read, nor have I seen the movie. So maybe I'll, I'll end up reviewing that. One that I have seen the movie of many times is uh, Child's Play 2. Now here's one that has, uh, you know, of late, of you know, over the past few years, gotten pretty uh, rare, and prices have been going up online. Uh, this is written by Matthew J. Costello, who is was a very respectable and established '80s horror writer, uh, and is based off the screenplay by Don Mancini. Uh, this uh, was published by Jove in 1990, and. Um, yeah, this movie, you know, I, I'm just a huge fan of the Child's Play franchise. I like all of them, you know, even even the ones that other people hate. And, uh, you know, Child's Play 2 may be the one I have gone to the most, you know, over the years. It's one that I very, uh, I remember very well when I was a kid and this had come out in the theaters. I, I was probably like eight years old. I was obsessed with it. I remember I had like recorded something on TV and like the commercial for this film was on that recording and I would watch the commercial over and over again. And I remember when the film uh, was first released on VHS, I remember going to the local video store with my mom and seeing the the new release wall and all of the, the tapes had been put out and I just like looking at the, the box art, which was the same uh, artwork and just like, you know, wanting to watch, be, just being so fascinated and curious about it. And of course, my mom would not let me rent it. I, I was only allowed to rent horror movies once a year and that was on my birthday uh, under her, her supervision, of course. And so I couldn't see this for so long. And then I remember like finally, maybe like a couple of months after it had been released on VHS, my buddy Alec called me up one day and was like, hey, dude, I rented Child's Play 2, come over. And I just remember like breathlessly riding my bike over to his house, like so excited to finally watch it. But yeah, a lot of good memories of this film. And then of course, you know, I couldn't have Child's Play 2 without having Child's Play 3, also written by Matthew J. Costello and adapted uh, from a screenplay by Don Mancini. This came out the following year, uh, also published by Jove in 1991. Yeah, they, they really rushed that film out. I think that there was like less than a year between Child's Play 2 and Child's Play 3. Uh, I don't have quite the same fond memories of this one as I do the second one. Although I watched this one uh, recently or not too long ago and it, you know, it's, it's fun for what it is. It's not bad. Okay, next up, we've got Invasion, I'm sorry, Invaders from Mars by Ray Garten, one of my favorite 80s horror writers. Uh, and this was adapted uh, from a screenplay by uh, Dan O'Bannon, my hero, legendary Dan O'Bannon, uh, and also Dan ja Don Jacoby. Uh, and that was, of course, based on an earlier screenplay since this was a an 80s remake. Uh, the original writer of the screenplay was Richard Blake. This was published by Pocket in 1986, and I do believe that is, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that that's newly commissioned artwork. I don't think that that was this, the, the poster artwork. I think this is actually a lot better than the poster artwork. And that always just uh, 
you know, floors me when I think that uh, they were commissioning, you know, artwork for these novelizations back in the day. I mean, I mean, that tells you that these things sold a lot, you know, they must have done really well. Uh, which is kind of interesting to think, but um, yeah, really, really like the, like that cover. Uh, Ray Garten, you're going to see here. I got a couple other uh, novelizations that he wrote. Uh, he was no stranger to the movie tie-in. The next one we've got is Nightmares on Elm Street, Part Four, The Dream Master, and Part Five, The Dream Child. Uh, now these were, uh, written by Joseph Locke. That is one of, uh, Ray Garten's pen names. And, um, let's see. So, uh, this book was published by St. Martin's Press in 1989, uh, to coincide with the release of Nightmare 5. And they just decided to kind of put, uh, I guess the novelizations of 4 and 5 together into one fairly slim book. And, uh, interestingly enough, I mean, although 4 and 5 are not that good really uh part four uh was adapted from a screenplay by brian helgeland uh and scott pierce brian helgeland uh went on to like win a cat like an academy award i think he wrote la confidential or something uh you know he he went on to some respectability but he's got to start with these uh friday uh films and then part five uh was uh the screenplay was written by uh leslie bohem uh, but also had um, uncredited work by uh, Skip and Spectre, the legendary uh, splatterpunk duo. Uh, they um, apparently they fought hard to get their name on this thing, and they I think they have, they did eventually get a story credit, but uh, maybe maybe that wasn't the best the best idea um, because Nightmare Five is not not the, the best movie. Um, but uh, yeah, Ray Garden writing. A Nightmare on Elm Street novelization. Of course, I'm going to be there. I love it, you know. Uh, and then another one by Joseph Locke, aka Ray Garten. Uh, you're going to be like, what the hell? Yeah, Good Burger. He did this one, just showing the range that Mr. Garten has. Uh, honestly, I don't know why I have this. I think I, uh, I think I found this somewhere for free or for fifty cents. It might have been at a library sale. Um, this was published by Minstrel Books in 1997, and this is such a 90s movie. God, it reminds me of uh, my freshman year of high school. Yeah, good burger. Okay, next up, we've got The Boogans. Uh, this uh, novelization was written by Charles E. Sellier Jr. and Robert Weverka. And the screenplay was written by Jim Koof and David O'Malley. This was published by Bantam in 1981. This is another one, surprisingly, although this is a pretty classic uh, 80s, I guess, creature feature. I have not seen the film. Um, I haven't seen it yet, nor have I read this novelization. So who knows? Maybe, uh, maybe I'll read the book first and review it for you guys, uh, even though, you know, maybe probably a few of you have seen this movie, but, um, yeah, I've heard, I've actually heard good things about the novelization. So I'm, I am looking forward to reading it. Okay. Next up, one of my absolute favorite creature features of all time, uh, the blob, uh, this novelization was written by David Bischoff, who, uh, was also the writer of mutants amok, the series that, uh, the first of which uh, I have reviewed recently and, and liked quite a bit. Uh, this is adapted uh, from a screenplay by uh, the legendary, well, to, to me, the legendary Chuck Russell and, and uh, Frank Darabont. Uh, I wish those two had done like, you know, a dozen horror movies in the 80s and 90s. Uh, they also did Nightmare on Elm Street 3, probably one of the best sequels of that franchise. Um, yeah, I absolutely love The Blob, just an absolute... Just, just a fun time. Just a great, great effects, great story. Everything comes together. Haven't read the novelization yet, but uh, hopefully I will one day. Okay, and next up, this is one that I'm. Um, this is one that's like pretty special to me. Um, this is Blood Feast, the novelization written by the Godfather of Gore himself, Herschel Gordon Lewis. Uh, this was put out by. Um, what is it? Let's see. Oh, I got to turn the page here. 
This was put out by um, Fan Fantico Enterprises in 1988. And I think it was then uh, uh, reissued in like 91 or something. This is the original uh, printing. And uh, yeah, this is this is pretty rare. I'm a huge fan of Herschel Gordon Lewis. Love Blood Feast. Um, and so yeah, this this is one of those um, treasures that I uh, that, that's very special to me. Okay, next up, we've got Return of the Living Dead by John Russo. Uh, this one has got kind of a convoluted history. So uh, basically, in 1978, John Russo wrote a sequel to Night of the Living Dead, which he had, you know, co-written, of course, with George Romero. Um, but then, and then he wrote the uh, screenplay uh, adaptation of that novel, and then they had given the novel or the screenplay that he had written to Dan O'Bannon, uh, who we talked about just earlier. Dan O'Bannon, of course, of, you know, Alien fame and Return of the Living Dead. Well, obviously this one. He, um, Dan O'Bannon uh, rewrote the screenplay so much, uh, basically it had very little uh, in common with the original draft that John Russo had written. Basically, all that was left was just the name, <laughs> Return of the Living Dead. So when it came around to doing the novelization, they decided to give it back to John Russo. So he ended up writing a novelization to a movie that is really just uh, based on a book of his, but in title only. So he wrote the, the thing twice, essentially, well, multiple times. So this is actually, so don't be confused. If you look up uh, Return of the Living Dead by John Russo. There are different versions. The 1978 version is the original novel he wrote. If you want the actual legit like novelization to the film, the Dan O'Bannon film, you want to go with the 1985 version. That's that's this one. And then this was also published. Um, this is the UK version. <clears throat> um, I don't know if I said this is from uh, Arrow. Uh, there's also a, a there was also a US edition, I believe, with with different cover art. But I really, I really enjoy that that cover art right there. Okay, next up, uh, another UK one. Uh, this is Plasmid. Uh, this was written by despite what the cover says, not uh, Joe Gannon. Uh, Joe Gannon is actually the writer of the screenplay. The, the actual novelization was written by Robert Knight, and uh, this is basically a novelization to a film that was never produced. So all we have is the novelization, um, and this was published by Star in 1980, and this seems like a lot of fun. Good old pulpy UK uh, horror from the early 80s, some of my favorite stuff. Definitely will read this one and review it. Um, yeah, looking forward to that. Okay, next up, we've got Piranha. Here's another misleading one, although uh, on the title, on the, the cover, it says it's written by John Sayles. Uh, John Sayles is actually the screenwriter. Uh, the, the, no, the, the person who wrote the novelization is a guy named Leo Callahan. And this was published by New English Library in 1978. Okay, next up. We've got The Incredible Melting Man. Uh, this novelization was written by Phil Smith and is based off of a screenplay by uh, Lawrence Lasker and Walter F. Parks. And this, uh, this book was published by Dell in... Um, or no, I'm getting all mixed up. This is Sorry, this is New English Library in 1978. I'm a fan of... Um, I'm a fan of this movie, even though it's... Totally mystery science theater. I mean, it's it's like objectively, it's, it's not a like a like the acting is terrible, but the makeup effects are amazing, and it's just funny because they tried so hard when this film came out to like make it be something big. Like all the posters of the film said, like the the next um, like great monster or something. Like they they had designs of this being like the next like Dracula or Frankenstein, and it clearly wasn't but uh it is charming it's it's a it's a fun little if you like like gooey goopy effects and just like you know bad movies it, it's it's a blast okay next up we've got war games book i've never read uh for a film actually i've never even seen uh this was written by uh, david bischoff again the the dude 
who we talked about earlier, who did the Blob novelization and who wrote Mutants Amok. Um, this was, uh, yeah, sorry, gosh, I'm all messed up. This was based on a screenplay by Lawrence Lasker and Walter F. Parks. Incredible Melting Man earlier was, uh, the screenplay was from William Sachs. Gosh, it's messing up my facts here. But uh, yeah, this one, uh, this was published by Dell in 1983. And uh, this was actually, uh, this is the, the most recent one I got. Uh, there's a teacher at my school who's retiring this year, and she basically is just like clearing out her room. And she let she let me kind of go through her books and uh, found, found, saw this on the shelf. And I was like, hell, I'll pick that up. The name David Bischoff stood out to me. Okay, next up, we've got Shocker by uh, Randall Boyle. Uh, this is, of course, based on the screenplay by uh, Wes Craven. And uh, this, this edition here is published by Corgi in 1990. I, I, I like this movie, uh, Shocker, actually. Uh, I know it's one of the, like, I feel like it's one of the more underrated uh, Wes Craven films. Clearly, uh, you know, he was trying to uh, come up with a new franchise, one that, that he owned and had control of. I think, he, you know, he was a little salty that he had lost the rights to his creation, Freddy Krueger, and like New Line was making all that Freddy money. So he, he was probably hoping that he would strike gold with uh, Horace Pinker here. A uh, great name, by the way. Um, but uh, sadly, it did not, you know, take off with audiences and, you know, didn't get a franchise. But I enjoy Shocker for what it is. Uh, Randall Boyle, who also, you know, wrote other novelizations for, you know, things like Dark Man and Demon Knight, um, he's supposed to be a really good writer. I have not read anything of his, but I've heard like his original uh, paperback horror novels are, are good. Uh, I have a couple of those. Looking forward to getting to them, uh, hopefully soon. Okay, a couple more novelizations here. Uh, we've got The Dark by uh, Max Franklin. Uh, this is based off of a screenplay by Stanford Whitmore. And this was published by Signet in 1978. Okay, next up, we've got Visiting Hours, slasher from the early 80s. Uh, the, this book was written by Kent Rembo and uh, is based on a screenplay by Brian Taggart. This book was published by uh, Pinnacle in 1982. The movie stars uh, the the great, great Michael Ironside, who I just will watch in anything. All right, and finally, my last novelization, uh, one that is probably like the most special to me, despite its lame cover. Uh, this is the novelization of Fright Night. Uh, this is uh, important to me for a number of reasons. A, because Fright Night is one of my favorite horror films of all time. It's just, uh, you know, it's one that I can go back to again and again. It's, it's, a, it's a comfort film. Um, and it's written, the novelization is written by Skip and Spectre, the great uh, John Skip and Craig Spectre, uh, the kings of splatterpunk. Um, this was, you know, early on in their, in their collaboration. I think this was like right after they published their first novel, The Light at the End, which I love. Um, and, you know, based off of a screenplay by Tom Holland, the great Tom Holland, who's also responsible for, uh, you know, Child's Play. Um, yeah, so this is one that also has, you know, become quite a rarity. I know prices of this can, can get quite high online. Um, yeah, I have not actually read this novelization. It's one of those books that I'm just like saving for, you know, a I don't know when. Maybe, maybe I'll read this this summer. I probably won't review this because we all know Fright Night. But um, yeah, great, great movie. And um, yeah, you can't go wrong with a novelization by uh, Skip Inspector because, you know, John Skip was just an amazing writer. All right. So guys, that uh, those are my uh, novelizations. So as I said, you know, not the hugest collection, but, uh, you know, not not too bad. Um, you know, there are definitely some uh, glaring, I guess, omissions, you would say. Like, you know, I, I mean, I would love to have, you know, like the Halloween or yeah, the Halloween uh, books from uh, Jack Martin. It'd be cool to have some of those Friday the 13th novelizations. Probably my number one, uh, 
you know, wish list novelization is brain damage. Uh, believe it or not, there was a novelization uh, published in like 1990 or 91 of brain damage uh, written by Robert Martin, Uncle Bob uh, of Fangoria, one of the early editors of Fangoria. And, um, you know, of course, adapted from a screenplay by Frank Hennenlauter. That was published in a very, you know, small, limited, limited, like, press. Uh, and it's it's quite rare now. But thankfully, that book is on Kindle. So I do have it on Kindle. So I'll be able to read it. But, you know, it, it would be cool to have the, the original paperback of that. But uh, that's one that I'm, you know, will be on the lookout for. Okay. So before we go, though, I do want to show you also, you know, a few... Um, just random sort of movie related books since, you know, this is movie mayhem, you know, when else am I going to have a chance to do this? So, um, first up this one I bought, I'm not going to lie. I bought this just for the cover. Uh, this is the horror film quiz book by Sean Hudson. Uh, love that picture of, uh, <laughs> badass Skeletor, uh, Sean Hudson. This was pub published by Sphere in 1991. Next up, I've got uh, a movie poster book. I'm a huge fan. Obviously, you know, you guys can tell probably from my love of these vintage paperbacks. I love the old artwork. Uh, this is 60 great horror movie posters from 2003. And this was uh, collected by uh, Brian Hershenson. And it's got, you know, like full color, uh, just pictures of... You know, like it's got classic movie posters, but then like toward the back, it's got some more, um, more recent ones. Pretty cool. I love that kind of stuff. And then I also got a uh, 60 great sci-fi movie posters. It was also published in 2003 and, uh, just got, you know, it's got cool, cool, like glossy, uh, colorful, um, science fiction. Look at that. Inseminoid. Amazing. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> okay, next up. This one is really, really... I love this book. Uh, this is the Official Splatter Movie Guide, uh, Volume 1, it turns out. Uh, this is by John McCarty. And um, this was published by St. Martin's Press in 1989. And it just has a bunch of like little capsule reviews of splatter flicks. And although I don't always agree with this guy, uh, in fact, a lot of the times I would just straight up disagree with, with what he said about him. Uh, it's still really fun to read this. I mean, I read it cover to cover and I actually discovered, uh, you know, a few books or a few movies that I was unaware of. So if you're a, you know, a splatter movie fan from that golden age, uh, check this one out as well as... The Splatter, the official Splatter Movie Guide Volume 2. He made, uh, he did like an update of, of that one. Well, not an update. I mean, a whole, a brand new one. This was published by St. Martin's Press in uh, 1992. So this one covers like, you know, from 89 to 92. And again, it just has a bunch of like, you know, short little reviews of Splatter flicks. And it's just a lot of fun. Um, really fun to read those old reviews and discover, you know, some stuff that you hadn't heard of before. But honestly, more than those, probably my favorite of that type of book is this one right here. Uh, the Gore Score 2001, The Splatter Years. Uh, this, um, this was published yeah, in 2001 by Michael Matthews Publishing. Uh, and I do think this is out of print now. Uh, but... This is by Chaz Ballin, who is a legend in splatter circles. Uh, Chaz Ballin was a writer and uh, a film critic. He wrote uh, for Fangoria, and he had a, a great column in Gore Zone uh, magazine. And this guy really knew his stuff. Uh, sadly, he passed away, but um, he just, you know, he he has he's just so fun to read. And and this is also, you know, similarly has reviews of splatter flicks but um you know it's really cool because he gives the, the movie a rating but then he gives it like a gore rating too and um yeah this, this is one of like my favorite reference books for splatter films um if you can find this anywhere if you can get a hold of this and you're you know a gore hound or a splatter film fan definitely check it out okay and then we got some coffee table books here 
Um, this one, I really like this book. This is Pumpkin Cinema uh, by Nathaniel Toll, and this was published by Schiffer Publishing in 2014. I, uh, I came across this in uh, Amoeba in Hollywood, and I was like, huh, what's that? And I kind of just, I started flipping through it, and I was just hooked. I was just hooked, and I had to have it. This is just a really fun book. I always put it on my coffee table uh, every October. And, um, you know, it gives reviews of books, or sorry, I keep saying books, <laughs> movies that um, are, you know, not all of them are like directly related to Halloween, but they all have that kind of spooky, kind of Halloween-like atmosphere. And again, I ha discovered a couple of movies from reading this book that I was unaware of. And um, yeah, it's just just a lot of fun. If you're a Halloween fan, uh, you know, a fan of the holiday, and you like those kind of spooky Halloween type movies, great book to have. Okay, this one uh, is gonna stress my arms. This is massive tome here. Um, <laughs> okay, we've got Nightmare USA by Stephen Thrower. This is like basically the exploitation bible. This thing, I mean, this thing is massive. Say so you could kill someone with this. Um, this was published by Fab Press in 20, 2007. And uh, yeah, I have not read all of this. I'm, you know, making my way through it very, very slowly. But basically just like the most exhaustive, comprehensive, um, you know, sort of history that you could get on the American exploitation uh, film movement. So, uh, you know, for a guy like me who loves this stuff, um, you know, very, very uh, good resource to have and, and uh, very entertaining, uh, very like kind of like an academic sort of uh, analysis of exploitation, which you don't see uh, very often. All right. And finally, guys, the last thing we're looking at today, uh, this is my, my favorite uh, coffee table book of all time. Uh, if you are, you know, a viewer of my channel, you know how much I love, you know, like old vintage uh, paperbacks. A lot of it is, you know, the artwork is so nostalgic and awesome. This is the movie version. Uh, this is VHS video cover art. Uh, this is a fantastic book. I cannot, uh, you know, sing its praises highly enough. This, um, this book was edited by Tom Hodge came out, I believe, in 2015, and um, I actually uh, went, when this book was first released, I uh, went and met Tom Hodge. He was signing the book at um, Dark Delicacies, which is a cool little uh, bookshop in Burbank, California, and I, you know, I, I talked with him a little bit. He signed it, and um, yeah, he, he's a great guy. He, he's an artist. He, he does, like, kind of throwback um, movie posters. Well, he did this artwork here to give you an idea, but you know, he's done posters for, you know, like throwback films, like, um, like Wolf Cop. He did like the house of the devil, I think. Um, you know, a cu couple other ones, but, uh, yeah, this book is just so fun. And they're all the UK, uh, VHS, uh, cover art. So like, you know, some of them were very like unknown to me. Like I didn't, I hadn't, um, I hadn't seen a lot of these before, but just like gorgeous, gorgeous stuff. Like they're like, for example, grave misdemeanors, like that artwork I had never seen before. Uh, that is, um, that's actually known in the U S as a, a movie called nightlife, which I like a lot, but the U S cover art is super lame. That UK cover art as a lot of the UK cover art, uh, was much, much superior. So, um, yeah, a lot of cool stuff like that, but, uh, yeah, this, this is, um, Really, really cool coffee table book. It's kind of falling apart because I've gone through it so often. I love it. So, yeah, there you go, guys. There is an, a little 34-minute uh, video. Jesus. Um, you probably didn't watch it this far, but if you did, thank you. Um, hope you enjoyed seeing some of those titles. Uh, stay tuned. Tomorrow I should have my next book review up. Uh, and, you know, for the rest of this month, be on the lookout for other sort of movie-related videos. Uh, thanks for watching, guys. I will see you later. Peace out.